So this is entitled, Don't Let Lawyers Ruin Your Analytics. And really, they're not going to come into your R code, trust me. But what they are going to do is uh, ruin your data and uh, rip it from your hands and make you, uh, you know, hide everything useful in it or, or make it you know, just completely useless. So uh, the lawyers are coming, people. Um, but about me, uh, I started off doing uh, signal processing, developing SAR maps. Um, which is really data intensive and math intensive. Uh, and I got sick of that and I went to the NSA where uh, they have lots of data, it turns out. And, um, <laughs> and we, we processed a lot of it. So I know there was the cell phone guy yesterday. Yeah, we had some of that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but more importantly, I developed uh, uh, Apache Accumulo there, which is uh, uh, a big table, Google big table based, it's like HBase. Uh, but it has cell level security built into it. So every piece of information in that database has metadata with it about the, the security requirements uh, required to see that piece of data. Uh, so a group of us left and we formed Immuta where we do uh, something similar for all the other databases in the world. So we're this kind of data access layer that you install and we talk to your MySQLs and your Postgres and Hive and apply access controls and uh, data masking and all that kind of stuff uh, to your data where it sits. Um, <clears throat> and, a, and a big reason for doing all this is this. The, the GDPR is this European Union lawyer thing coming your way, whether you like it or not. This is a snapshot from their website. Like they even have this doomsday countdown <laughs> coming like this is going to be in effect. And you might think, well, I'm not in the EU. I don't care. I'm in the US. But actually, the law applies to every EU citizen data. And they, they kind of look at uh, your data as an extension of yourself. So like your data has rights just like a person has rights. And that's how they're writing this law. So uh, and the, the penalty is stiff. So if, uh, if a company violates uh, statutes of the GDPR, uh, the penalty can be up to 4% of your global revenue. So if you were Apple and you made $216 billion last year, that would be $8 billion fine. Um, they won't like it if your data scientists violate uh, data rights of EU citizens and you cost them $8 billion. So that's what this is about. How can we get around doing that? Um, so, yeah, first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. <laughs> but you guys seem like a much calmer group, so let's actually just use statistics. Um, so I'm going to be talking about data privacy scenarios, uh, you know, three scenarios where you want to release some data, another scenario where you're actually collecting data, and then maybe interactively interacting with your data. So, so the first is releasing data is generally a bad idea to release a big group of data that you think you anonymized to the world because there will be someone out there that de-anonymizes it. That's the big lesson learned. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, the uh, you know, subjects of the data cannot be re-identified while the data remain practically useful. So the, the key word there is practically useful. So you can anonymize data and have it be useless, but can we do it in a way that, that may, makes it useful? Um, so here is uh, from the K anonymization paper, their little table of K anonymization, and K is two, and you're trying to, to hide that, that sensitive problem column. And uh, basically, if you look at it and you kind of do group by any column, you'll end up with more than one row being returned, um, which is great. So any single row cannot be identified kind of from, from a query. Um, so uh, what's interesting, though, if you look at the last two rows, even the guys that tried to, tried to do k-anonymization kind of had a problem in that these last two rows are the same, so that doesn't really even though the K is two, that's not really anonymized because the problem is the same. So this, this led to you know, other things called L diversity, <laughs> which you know, ensures there's ample diversity in those groups. So, so getting rid of those, those chest pain problems, making sure there's more variety in your results. And then it became T closeness where they said, hey, actually the statistical distribution of that data in those groups has to be representative of overall in the data. So like your mind is probably exploding as to how you're going to do all these group buys and figure all this out. And the answer is you shouldn't. Um, 
So uh, there's many attack vectors available to de-identify this kind of data when you release it in a, in, a, in a big group. It's always out there. You can't unring the bell, as they say. Uh, there's linkage attacks. There's temporal attacks. Uh, you know, complementary release attacks. If you release more data later, you can like de-anonymize the older data you did by accident. That's horrible. So, and the world is full of like examples of doing this poorly. AOL did it. Uh, they uh, released a bunch of search terms that they anonymized, and then someone went through and they found poor user number four four one seven seven four nine Thelma Arnold, sixty two year old widow in Georgia, that then got to sue AOL because people got to see about her complaining about her dog peeing on her carpet too much in her search terms. Um, Netflix also did this, and uh, researchers correlate it with IMDb ratings, and it turns out movie nerds are movie nerds, and they really rate on Netflix like they do on IMDb, and they correlated people, and they de-identified them, um, and Netflix got sued. And then even the, the good old New York City Taxi Commission released some data, and people correlated it with photos of, uh, from the paparazzi, and they were able to determine that at 7.34 p.m. July 8, 2013, Bradley Cooper went from Tribeca to Bank Street for $9 cash and left no tip. Um, <clears throat> or, I mean, in his defense, no tip was recorded by the, uh, by the driver. Uh, so, so yeah, there's all kinds of attacks and all kinds of failures there. I would, I would really suggest against it, even though the GDPR does, does talk about anonymization techniques and masking and stuff like that, and that's what you might think of with, with HIPAA and stuff, but there's other things we can do. Um, so one is randomized response. So I'd like to do a little study here, um, and, and randomized response is, is how you collect the answer to what would be a sensitive question. So in this group, I came up with a sensitive question to ask you all, and it is, uh, who would rather develop in Python than R? Now, I'm sure there's some of you here. I heard one speaking earlier, I assume. Um, <clears throat> so how would we get a truthful response to this with you know, all these glaring eyes of our developers around? Well, what we would do is we'd say, uh, pick a number or roll a dice, and um, you know, everyone think of a number between one and six, all right, and I say, all right, whoever thought of three, just raise your hand and tell me, yes, you would prefer Python. Right? So you would get this group of people that is just blindly saying yes to this question. And then the people that actually want to say yes, if you didn't choose a three, you tell me the truth, yes or no. So you have all these people that rolled the die and you know, had, were forced to answer yes, uh, masking the people that uh, you know, truly prefer Python over R. So, so they can be hidden in the masses. And um, <clears throat> even if we do that, we can do math, and uh, you'll have to take my word for it that that's how you back out this true proportion from this one-sixth uh, of people just blindly telling you yes. Um, <clears throat> so randomized response is actually now how Google and Apple are uh, sending, if you've ever seen this little checkbox, send anonymous usage data back to Google. They're actually taking all your settings and putting it in a giant bloom filter you know, hash table thing, and adding all kinds of noise to that bloom filter every time they send it from your computer to them. And then what they do is they don't know what your particular settings are in your browser, but they have enough Chrome users that they can beat down the statistics in those bloom filters and find out statistically what the settings are when things break. So that's what they're doing when they say, uh, you know, send us, send us anonymous results. So they actually wrote a paper about it. Um, unfortunately, the paper uh, says they use, quote, advanced statistical techniques to uh, determine the, uh, the true proportions of stuff. And, and their technique is, is pretty complicated, but they don't say how they beat out the statistics. But I'm sure it's, it's advanced and, and fancy and impressive. But maybe they'll write another paper later telling us how to, how to get it. Um, <clears throat> So, so my big, uh, the big thing that I could talk about forever, like at the bar, it's a, it's a hot topic, let me tell you, uh, is differential privacy. So what this is, is a more uh, mathematically formalized way of, of, of maintaining data privacy. And it, it mathematically uh, trades off uh, usefulness for privacy. Um, 
So a lot of people, when they start learning about differential privacy, they go, oh, well, I ran this query, and you gave me back junk. And what the differential privacy advocates say, you're welcome. You know, your, <laughs> your privacy was maintained. So ask a better question. So that's really what we're going to have to start doing is asking questions in different ways because we know these techniques are being done on the data as it's collected. Um, so differential privacy, I'll try to give you a quick, quick rundown. Um, so if you have two data sets, D1 and D2, that differ by one entry, and you want to run some aggregate uh, calculation or query over that data, differential privacy says that, um, that the, uh, the, the results of those two queries um, basically don't differ by more than this e to the epsilon factor. Uh, and epsilon is known as the, the privacy budget. So what is epsilon? It's a, it's a number, you pick it, uh, write a lot of R code to explore the space of your epsilon you picked and how it's gonna get, get uh, beat down. But, uh, but what's interesting about this, this definition of differential privacy is it doesn't tell you, like, you know, how to do this at all. Um, so, and those, so those probabilities there are taken over the, uh, over the function you decided to, to run on the data, not the data itself. Um, so let's talk about the sensitivity and robust statistics of, of functions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to, to get a good number for this epsilon and maintain privacy, uh, if you look at sensitivity as being the, the maximum difference uh, of any two data sets. And so if, if your data set is the entire you know, real number set, you would have to create two versions of that and then uh, you know, figure out what the maximum difference is between those two data sets uh, for any given uh, function on those data sets. So that's, that's a daunting task. So generally you wanna, you wanna bound your data uh, inputs to, to some limit so you can figure out uh, what the sensitivity of your function on that data set might be. Um, but sensitivity is like a topic for PhDs to go off and study, and you can read all kinds of papers about it if you want. Um, but, but really, the easy way to think about it is with, um, you know, like the housing market. If you have four houses here, you have that Whopper $30 million house at the end of the block, and um, if you calculate the, the, the mean, of, of that data set, the, the sensitivity of that data is on the order of the $30 million house for the, um, for, uh, the, the mean calculation. So to hide the fact that that house either was or wasn't in the data set, I would have to add noise proportional to $30 million. So basically any question you would ask me about this housing data set, I'd be like, uh, $30 million. And that's not very useful, right? So you should ask better questions. And like a better question here is the median. So you know, if, you had the, if any one of those uh, houses disappeared there, your sensitivity of the median is around $10,000. So if you ask me questions, I could add, and, and you were doing the median calculation, I could just add noise in the neighborhood of $10,000 uh, to protect uh, uh, the individual house data in that data set. So to do this, uh, we conveniently have this Laplace uh, distribution. And uh, the Laplacian method is a differentially private method, and it's been proved. Um, but uh, basically, you take a random draw from, your, um, uh, from a Laplacian distribution, and you set the B value to that delta M, your sensitivity over your epsilon, add that noise to the result, boom, you gave them a statistically accurate noisy result to their query. Um, now, a problem comes in that you have random draws and adding noise. If they run the same query over and over again, they can beat all that down and get the real answer. Um, so don't let them do that or have a bigger privacy budget. It's, it is a problem, and, it, and I don't know that it's been solved. So uh, one, there, there are other methods that are differentially private. So basically what you, what you try to do is, is come up with an analysis system and then prove that, it's, that it maintains that differential privacy ratio. And uh, one kind of easier one than just re adding random Laplacian noise is known as a sample and aggregate method, where you're actually localizing the sensitivity to the data instead of to the query method. 
So here what you're doing is um, breaking up your data set into sample sets, running the query independently on all those sample sets, and then aggregating them together with a function like the median. And then you can actually calculate the sensitivity of that median, because you actually have all those Z values there, add noise proportional to that, and then get out a differentially private answer. Um, and people have moved on from, from standard database queries to machine learning queries, where they're using independent data sets kind of in a similar uh, way to, to train all these, these teacher models and then use those teachers to train an aggregate model. And then that aggregate model, that, that aggregate teacher model um, can be exposed in a way that maintains the privacy of all the training data used to train your models. Um, so this is from uh, uh, a PhD postdoc at Penn State, uh, Nicholas Papernot, that, that I've, I've talked with. And, he, and he's the guy that has done, you know, the, uh, the, the, the taking a neural network of, of an image and adding what looks like random noise to the image and having the, the neural network, you know, classify a cat as an ostrich and uh, that kind of thing. So he, he's concerned of the privacy of neural networks and, and, and how they actually work. So I would suggest looking him up and looking up this, this paper. So it's uh, about all I have. I went fast. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> just, just be known that the laws are catching up to your data, and we're going to have to come up with better statistical techniques to kind of combat that. And uh, so know that you might be getting data sets that have noise injected into it on purpose uh, to maintain privacy. And when you're accessing data, you should be thinking about, you know, do I actually need to look at all this data? You know, what are the key columns I need? And I should restrict my analysis to those columns. So uh, as always, yeah, things can be overcome with good statistics. And that's all I have.